what I want to do first is what I like to do with these events is have uh, the creator of the project that they are working on actually present what they had worked on in the first place. So uh, Gabe is actually just going to play the game a little bit for us and just explain what we're seeing and what he uh, his thoughts were when designing it. So we're going to get started with that and then we'll do an interview and then a Q&A with you guys. So if there's any developers in the audience, any game developers here? Great. You can ask questions. So uh, yeah, let's start with that. Actually, let's start. So we'll start with the game. We have a controller right here. Yep. Um, so this is Ape Out. This is a video game that I worked on for a long time, five years roughly, um, and it came out on February twenty eighth this year. Um, and um, this is the beginning of it. Awesome. <laughs> uh, so yes, the game is broken up into four albums, um, each one of which has a, about eight levels, you can see there. Um, plus there's um, a secret hidden level. Uh, but, so right, uh, each, each level is an, is an album, is a different, is yeah. a different album title. Um, yeah, um, so yeah, I'm just going to start at the beginning of the game so you get a sense of what it is. Yeah, and the design, I know uh, one of the attendees here actually mentioned that it kind of looked like, I don't know if anyone on Saul Bass here, but a graphic artist who had done a lot of films like West Side Story, like the posters for it, and the design is very similar, so I'm, was there any inspiration? Uh, yeah, I was just ripping that shit off. Really? <laughs> oh, wow, okay. Yeah. Uh, I mean, at the beginning. I, okay. You know, it doesn't look exactly like it. But, yeah. Um, some stuff, you know. simulated drummer playing drums at all times and um, when things are chiller the drummer will play slower and hit the drums lighter and play uh, sparser patterns and then as things get more intense um, the drummer starts playing the drums harder and um, playing denser patterns and um, stuff like that. But yeah, the first of all the game is pretty good. Um, Right, it's, it's funny, even this is like the first level, and I remember even playing this one, I was having difficulty getting through the beginning of it, but I realized the game gets even much harder as yeah. it goes on. It's a hard game. Yeah. Um, and uh, the levels are procedurally generated, um, which uh, kind of just means that they're different every time, and uh, it's kind of four different modes than most procedural variant games, which uh, are procedurally generated to um, kind of distinguish runs from one another and kind of give you a unique flavor every time. And this is mostly just to kind of keep that improvisational feel. Yeah. Um, and to keep you on your toes. That's great. So I actually, I think we can, I can pause the game there and uh, we'll turn back that light on. Um, uh, well, yeah, we'll let you die first. And that's really cool. So like each each basically each level is like a is a labyrinth uh, that you have to get through uh, because the goal of the uh, game is to escape 
it's Abe out. Um, so what, what's cool is what you do there is you have, essentially you show the entire maze yep. that you're going through. Um, is this, this is a way for then the player, even if the game is hard, I guess, to see that and say like, do you think that a, 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 a player of this would be like, okay, this would help guide them for the rest of the... Yeah, it gives you a sense you know, of where you're going and it also um, kind of just gives you like a, a sense of, oops. Oh yeah. That's the wrong button. Uh, it gives you a sense of the, the how far in the level you've got, which yeah. otherwise it's very easy to kind of just get lost and not uh, have a sense of how how close you can. Yeah. Um, but then each one of these things is very different. Um, so like every album has like a unique flavor. Um, so I'll show like one more of those. Yeah, sure. Yeah. That'd be yeah. Great. And this, this album is like all bucket drumming as well. So it's like a different style of drumming on top of like a different um, kind of aesthetic and. Yeah. Um, then there are like big set pieces in the levels when. Uh, every two or three levels, there's like a big thing that happens. Like, yeah, and the person you had drumming for this was a fr was this uh, Matt Bach. Was that his name? Yeah. So he's a he's a. He didn't actually play any drums. He didn't play any Ironically. drums. <laughs> okay. Um, all the drums are. Um, um, so you can see this is like a very different vibe. So you can you um, can throw people out there. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. How hard was something like that to design, where you where you have hard? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so normally, I, I think I made this game in a pretty stupid way. It yeah. turns out uh, because like it's a game that I used to learn how to do a lot of things, and so I did them wrong, and then I was stuck with doing them wrong way. Um, which also kind of leads to a lot of the things that are unique about it. Um, but also, it's like. This game isn't 3D, it's all 2D. Yeah. And I'm just manipulating and drawing things to make it seem 3D. Um, so like this, um, these, this view out the window and like the guys falling, like that's just all fake. And it's just a lot of math and weird shaders that I did to get that to happen. Okay. And it was hard to do and it broke a lot and I had to fix it a lot of times. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, even to the extent of just the screen shaking when it actually hits the ground, yeah. uh, it's funny because when you play it, it's seamless. Like, it works so seamlessly and right. so smooth in the game, but I can't imagine the back end of it when you're actually designing something like that. Yeah. Um, it's hard. But, you know. Yeah. And then the silhouettes and... Yeah. Um, great. So I think, I think, yeah, we can pause it there if you want to move in a little bit. I think we'll... Uh, so, yeah, I mean, the thing that's so like, fascinating about this game also is that, like you mentioned, it being an improv-based game, and it really is an improv game, where it's like, jazz is essentially improvised, and this game feels like that, because what's so interesting is you have each level, so in a lot of video games, what you can have is, you play a level and you think, okay, I'm, I understand this level now, even if you keep dying, now I can win, because I get it, but with this game, you can't, it doesn't necessarily work like that because each level is randomly generated. Like every, yeah. so, where so the like, guards will be. Yeah. So certain bits of it are always the same. So like yeah. the stairs are always in the same place, for instance, mm -hmm. on this level. Um, and there are certain set pieces that are always in the same place. Um, but the majority of it is like filled in with random tiles and random guard placement. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know how familiar you guys are with video games. Just, I, yeah. Okay. As a just a general gauge. Roguelike. Yes. Ooh. Yeah. We got the back row. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the back row. As in rogue is a hack. Like rogue hack those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. 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 Um, but so there's like a. So if you know rogue and you yeah. know like net hack and yeah, stuff. I yeah. Yeah, I split it. Um, really? Oh, yeah. Cool. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Um, <laughs> for the front row. Mm. Uh, there's this whole genre of games that kind of have uh, popularized procedural generation, and it's kind of gone more mainstream in the last uh, 10 years, I would say, roughly, right? Maybe less than that. Um, where there are like different kinds of games that are using procedural generation. Uh, no Man's Sky is a big example that you probably have all heard of. Um, he was on Colbert, it was like a big deal, and people didn't like the game. <laughs> uh, but procedural generation is like used as like a, a way of like making a game kind of infinitely replayable and like 
makes it so that every time you play it, uh, you get a very divergent outcome and like you discover very different things and have a very different experience. That it is like a canvas for like emergent storytelling and all this stuff. And uh, I am not using it for that really, um, which kind of I think has set up expectations weirdly for this game. Um, I, but I, I'm kind of glad that I did it this way, and I feel like it's a a unique flavor um, because it really allows for that feeling of like improvisation when you're going through a level, and it kind of it emphasizes that kind of fluid knowledge. You know what I mean? That, yeah. Like, the, the, the you can't. It's not about memorization. It's about like this general uh, moment to moment. Mm -hmm. Finger knowledge, you know be, what I mean? Being, being present, I think, yeah. also being really present. There was, yeah. what was, I, I read in one of the interviews you had, it was called like, um, what, there, was, there was a name for it, it was like elegant, uh, it was like simple elegance or something like that, where is, or, what uh, was, was the name, for, yeah. Uh, I don't know what I was, I was saying, I might have said, been talking about games with elegant controls and that might, minimalist yeah. controls, maximalist environments. That might be what it is, because, I mean, I think when, when my friend had first told me about this game, it's a very, simplistically set up game. <laughs> What's happening? Um, it's a very simplistically set up game where it's essentially about an ape escaping wherever this ape is. It's a, uh, you know, uh, you're, you're st you start in a laboratory, then you move to a high rise, then you move to a jungle, and then a ship, and then it's like, it's, very, it's simplistic in that way, but it's actually ex extremely well developed. I was wondering on your end also, because I always think when I play a video game, I think like, okay, this is extremely hard, but also developers don't want to necessarily start a game or make a game that's so easy. Uh, so what was your mindset going to that about, like, okay, make Diffi it... Like difficulty-wise? Yeah, di just difficulty of the actual game, because it gets a lot harder as it goes on, as with most video games, but this yeah. one specifically is very difficult. <laughs> yeah, um, I think some of it is just, like, I like those games. Yeah. You know, and, like, I've gone back and forth a lot about how this game, how hard this game should be, and, like... Um, what exactly the flavor of the difficulty is, yeah. um, but um, a lot of it is just like I like personally being thrown into the deep end and like trying to figure it out, uh, especially when the type of problem that you're dealing with isn't um, about like learning a bunch of controls and all these systems that you that are not readily apparent, but instead like just. Uh, learning about like the fundamental uh, rules of the world, mm -hmm. and you have a simple means of approaching it. Um, but yeah, I think also part of it is just that uh, flavor-wise, uh, the game should be hard because it's hard. You're a gorilla, you know. You're, like, <laughs> yeah, you have your well, bare that's... hands against a bunch of dudes with guns. Well, that's like, on that note. What's interesting? It felt untrue when I made, made it too easy. I didn't feel like it was like simulating the situation properly. It's, it's interesting because you also like, you had said that the original game, the version of the game uh, was instead of an ape, it was a bald guy <laughs> who had little bald guy heads for hands. Mm. <laughs> and then the guards had bald spots. Yeah. <laughs> um, That's true. So, well I have to ask, so if that was the original, what, what was that? Um, <laughs> and then what led from that to be like, uh, okay, instead of bald people, I'm going to do an an ape. Um, well, so this game kind of took a long time to become, to like find uh, find its heart. You know what I mean? Um, it started out as like a time travel game. It's like I was like playing around with ideas and like uh, wanting to make a stealth game and like was interested in like all these things that ended up not really going in the game. And then uh, it was really, I was just learning how to do shit. So everything took me a long time and uh, it was kind of arduous and I didn't really have a great idea of what I was making at first. Um, and when it was the bald guy with bald guy head for hands, yeah, um, <laughs> like at that stage, it was just like I was kind of learning what I was doing and like following little things that I liked or found interesting about the game. So like, for instance, like the grabbing, right, is uh, originally it was like a very kind of uh, claustrophobic experience where you were like, you couldn't see very much uh, in front of you or around you, and you were just kind of like scared all the time. And so I was like, okay, 
might be interesting if you were able to like peek around corners and then I wanted to try to come up with like a tactile interesting feeling way of doing that so it's like okay you can like grab walls and like then once you grab the wall then you can like peek either way um, but then once you can grab a wall you know you gotta grab buttons you might as well be able to grab a dude yeah. you grab a dude what are you gonna do with him might as well throw him at 60 miles an hour <laughs> yeah. at the wall um, and then there were just like little emergent things that would come out of like grabbing people that I liked and then at a certain point it was like uh, yeah, it doesn't make sense that this is a that this is the tone of this game, or that the game is about a bald guy with bald guy hand heads, head hands. Um, that that was only they were only his hand, hands because I didn't feel like drawing a hand sprite at the time. So you were, you were able to just because you had already made the bald head. So I like, made the head, and I'm like okay. that was enough work. <laughs> yeah. so when, when, when I read that, I'm like that's really creative. That's really unique. No, it's lazy. Um, yeah. But laziness equated to you un you need uniqueness yeah. for me. Um, uh, wow, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then I never drew any more sprites. Everything became okay. so white. <laughs> Do you still want to make a bald guy game? Um, I don't know. At the okay. time I had alopecia. Oh, okay. Uh, so like my hair was falling out and I was like thinking about it. And I, actually, I was in film school I made a movie about it. And uh, I just thought it was funny to like make a, a top-down game about a bald guy. Because it's like you're looking <laughs> yeah, directly at his head. Yeah, at all times. <laughs> Oh wow. Okay. Um, well, that's. I wanted to talk about that too because you. Um, what I found so interesting. You you wanted to be a filmmaker yeah. going into NYU, and not a game developer. And before you got to NYU, you had never uh, created a game or yeah. created a video game. Yep. So I'm wondering if you discuss that transition from going into film and then deciding you want to become a game developer. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I went to Tisch, and um, it's. I don't know. I don't know how many people have been through that program. Uh, yeah. Some people, yeah, yeah. got some Tish people here. Have a flavor of what it's like, um, but like it's it's a weird experience, and it's like you don't get to make any movies for the first year that you're there, um, and there are some good parts of it, but it mm -hmm. feels a little bit kind of um, just you're only doing fundamentals, and you're not really able to create anything that you're that proud of. And then going to the second year, um, I had one really great film class where I made a bunch of short films, but it's also a point where um, they start kind of drilling into you that like, hey, we know you came to this school and you wanted to be a director to like a room of 300 people or whatever, but actually you're not going to be a director because odds are you're not. And really what you should do is you should pick a niche. We have plenty of them, um, and get really good at that. We have a lot of tracks for all the different niches, and um, go as far as you can with that. And then, hopefully, you get hired on sets, or maybe you get coffee for people who are doing that niche for a couple of years. And then wow. maybe eventually, you get to like be an editor for ads. You know? <laughs> wow. It's like uh, that didn't seem super appealing, um, and. Uh, at that point, I also, like, second semester, sophomore year of college for me was this really kind of sharp contrast between that kind of flavor and that, like, um, that was kind of the vibe. Everyone was kind of, like, sorting themselves into different niches, um, including my friends. And uh, I was taking this TV class, which was taught by this kind of mummified guy. <laughs> who had been directing soap operas for 45 years. Um, and he was awful. And, <laughs> um, it was just like, I mean, of course, right? You directed soap opera for 45 years. Like, mm. He doesn't have any zhuzh. He doesn't have any like, oh, I'm alive. I don't have, he doesn't have anything that's like, he doesn't value anything artistic. He just values like getting the thing done on time, mm -hmm. right? Um, and efficiency. And so like I did this class where we like basically made soap operas, right? And we all like worked as the crew for each other. And at the same time I was taking um, this class called Games 101 with Frank Lance. And uh, Frank, who's the head of the games program at NYU, um, has a really great way of being an interested, doubting person. 
<laughs> so kind of uh, cautious yeah. in some way, but, but still interested in what you're doing. Well, I mean, he was just talking about games, yeah. but he was like able to do it in a way that was like deeply nuanced and interested in nuance and mm. unsure of um, what was good and what was bad and what was the the what made a thing popular or, or what made a thing um, important at a particular time and uh, was able to just like complicate and make interesting all these different parts of games. Uh, and that contrast was like, in film school, not only are they telling you to go into niches, but they're also like just touting certain films as like, hey, maybe one day, yeah. if you are the, the if you are just great, you'll make a film like that seventy percent as good as Taxi Driver, maybe. That's amazing. well. That, well, I, I want to say also because you, you, so the TV class was having you make soap operas. Yeah. Um, that was it. A specific soap opera class, or was it? It was, it, just, it was just a general TV class. But that's it was called a TV studio class. I find that when what year was this? Sophomore year. Was that was that like twenty? That was a few years ago. Yeah, it was twenty uh, twelve. I, I asked yeah. because especially in the last like ten years or so, TV has been. Like you've had such high quality television that I find it right. interesting that yeah. the TV class that they did was soap opera based, which can be good to learn, I think, as a foundation. But yeah. that's especially getting a professor who just goes by the book and isn't passionate about it. That's unfortunate. Yeah, it's not. It wasn't the best experience I've ever had. Yeah, where, where <laughs> but, 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 you, but you took the games one on one class, and you and like you're saying, you found a professor who found the nuance and found the passion. Was yeah, it, that would. Yeah. yeah, and it was just like it just felt more like an open and interesting field where like interesting work was still happening every year. Yeah, and it was like changing how people thought about video games and what they could do. And it's interesting because also like the film program is seems like it's set up to have you follow the career track that's like just very bureaucratic and very like going through stages of what you feel you have to do, which is any any art based thing. I've, the advice I've always gotten is don't don't do what you feel you have to do, just follow what you want to do. Yeah. Um, which is not necessarily easy, but yeah. It did not feel like art school in that way at all. Mm. Yeah. It was like, it felt closer to a trade school. So it, it felt like a trade school, whereas with the games program, though, you, they, it emphasized that, I guess, passion part. And that, I think that's what's so inspiring about the game, too, is that it's, it's, it's that DIY, like, you, but you feel the passion through it because it's like, it's not a game that necessarily, like, I don't know, you know, if, if you were to go to a games program that was similar to your TV program, there's probably not yeah. people saying, well, this is what you have to do, you have to, you know, you, it would be unfortunate because this is the thing you wanted to do more, you found. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was a really sharp contrast. And it was like, yeah. at that point, it was like, I kind of just went and tried to do it. Um, like that summer, after that semester, it was like, I went home and I was like, I had the summer, I basically didn't have any plans for the summer. Um, but you and you had no experience with coding up until that point. No, but my brother was a CS person, and he was around. Okay, so you had, uh, your, you had your brother to consult then. Yeah, so I and I was afraid of code because I he had like tried to teach me how to code when I was like eight. And yeah, I was trying to teach me Lisp, and like it's bad. It's yeah, like, yeah. Oh, I was like, oh, I'm I'm the art brother. Don't worry. That's <laughs> yes, I, no. I I, one, it's fine. I have a friend in here who taught me in college to try to, to code, and I just I was like, I just this is. It's gonna to be too hard for me, you know. Whereas it's really intimidating. It's, yeah. very, it's very intimidating. I think that's why. But it's it's um, and I know that's that what, what you learned on originally was something called Game Maker, mm -hmm. and then you switched to Unity, which are two separate game engines. So for anyone here who doesn't know what game engines are, can you describe what Game Maker and then Unity are, and how you how that helped you make this game? Yeah. And um, previous games. Uh, yeah. So there are a lot of different game engines, and they all have their pros and cons, and most games are made in them at this point. Um, but uh, Game Maker is much simpler. It's mostly made for um, making 2D games uh, that are sprite-based and action games, mostly. Uh, there are actually a lot of commercial games that are made in Game Maker, um, but they are typically 2D action games. Uh, and it is like a really good way to get started, at least it was for me, because you don't actually need to have that many high-level programming concepts down to do stuff. Um, because I just would have jumped off the ship if I had to learn that stuff right away. Um, but like you, it's really a space where you can like learn the basics 
and get shit to happen without um, having to like understand what's happening under the hood. Well, I think the thought is then how, how do you create a game then without having to code anything? Oh, I mean, I coded stuff. But you like, still it's coded a, on Game Maker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, okay. I did a lot of coding, but the, fl the flavor is a little bit different. Mm. Uh, you don't really have to know about the kind of more macro code concepts. You mostly just have to know, like, this is an if statement, and this is a variable, and like, like, the, the, you know, you know what those are. You tried to learn how to code for two weeks in college. Less than two weeks, but uh, <laughs> for a little bit, yeah. Yes, yeah. I, I learned that even that was intimidating to me. Uh, right. So that was overwhelming for me. But um, Right, so you, so you went through those, though. You went yeah. through those for Game Maker. And like that, yeah. yeah, for me it was like catnip at the beginning. Actually, like as soon as I like got a taste for it and like got mm -hmm. over the first little bit and I could like make stuff move, uh -huh. um, I like would just sit my brother down there was a day where I was just like going for like five hours and just like having him tell me things, and it was like. And he was okay with that. Yeah, he's extremely uh, accommodating. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he was, he's a uh, yeah, he's an interesting person, but he will help you forever. Is okay. is maybe his like the most saintly trait. This is your older older brother. Yeah, older brother. Um, wow. It's like he helps everybody, and it's really like. If he has the knowledge and he has the capacity, he will take time. Wow. And, and, and it's great, and I try to pay it forward as much as I can. Um, and is he currently developing, is he, is he designing no. and developing games? Well, actually, he, at the time he was working on um, computer vision, and he was like building a robot that, um, for a company that would like pick strawberry uh, flowers. Uh, so he was like wow. working on software that, okay. would, that would look at a, an image, a top-down image of a strawberry field, and tell you where the flowers were, so that a robot could then pick the flowers. Does he want to make that into a video? <laughs> or? No. Okay. It turns out that wasn't his path. Okay. <laughs> um, wow. But he now, ironically, like since then, and partially because I got into games, actually um, now works at the engine Unity. He works for, oh, wow. for Unity and. Um, in San Francisco and makes, works on that engine that I'm using to make games. And that's because you got into this? I mean, you know, it's not a direct causal thing. Yeah. But I did help him get into games, which then made him want to get wow. involved and stuff like that. Well, so I know, I want to start with that. So Game Maker, so you started doing that. And then with, with, through Game Maker is how you created your first game, Foiled? Foiled, yeah. And Foiled. And that's, uh, you, you had a passion for fencing growing up. And mm -hmm. so that, that game was centered around that. Yeah, Passion. that was like, yeah, it was, um, it started out as just like a little, like I wanted to try making a little fencing game, mm -hmm. just as like a, my first game sort of deal, and then kind of, again, in a similar way, ballooned into a much bigger project that took like a little more than six months, and I worked with a friend in high school who did the art for it, and, and then released it, and it got some attention, and it was nice. But that, that's what I'm really curious about is like, so I think because a lot of people can create a game at their home and just uh, work with someone on it, release it, and then just it goes, it could possibly, like, and it, it probably the same with films where it doesn't necessarily go, the, uh, get eyes on it. Yep. So how does a game like that that you create, even if it's really high quality and really well done, how does it then get eyes on it and get people paying attention to it? Um, well, so one thing is that it was easier in 2013. Mm -hmm. It gets harder every year. Um, but in 2013, people were still interested, and in, like, even if you released a game for free, people would, uh, and you released like gameplay, and people thought it looked good, they would download it and play it. Um, at least some of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't think that's as true now, just because of how saturated the world is with indie games at this point. Um, so I think a lot of it is like timing and luck. Mm -hmm. um, but also, uh, you know, I think it's okay. I think it's pretty good. Uh, yeah. One game, you know? Well, yeah, and that's the thing. So, like, and then that, that getting getting eyes on that game, where like, I, I wanted to talk about that too, just because you you had worked with your NYU professors, and you're now yeah. an adjunct professor at NYU. Yep. Uh, what was that feeling working directly with professors to create uh, these games? Well, so foiled was I actually so I came back after the summer with foiled when yeah. half done, and then I started working. Uh, in an independent study with Ben and Fadi, um, who had actually just arrived from the, at the university after quitting his career of um, medical philosophy. Oh, is that what that? Yeah. 
Well, but Ben and Fadi also. Does anyone here know the game? Uh, was it Quap? Quap. Yeah, does anyone yeah. know that game? Yeah. So it's basically it's a game where you. Uh, what is it? It's play. How do you describe it? You play as a, a, a track. Uh, yeah, you control each joint or each. Each. Um, I'm trying to remember. Like. Body segment. Yeah, you're basically like a runner on a on a on a track, and you can yeah you control every single segment, and if you mess up, you flip like all the way upside down. Um, and it's but a big game. It was hugely popular, um, and so he was at NYU, and you started working with him directly. Yep, and that was really great. That was like uh, he was able to like provide a framework for design that I like really needed, and um, I was just like. Yeah, you know, just like as I was just interested in the way he thought about things and like trying to internalize it as much as I could. What would he tell you that you maybe hadn't thought of before? Um, it's like a lot of it has to do with like minutia because like I mean, it's like a two D action game, right? There's an, uh, and it's like local multiplayer, single screen, like it's about as simple of a game as you can imagine. Mm -hmm. But um, he just would think about problems in a slightly different way than I did, um, and uh, I guess he just had like a little bit, uh, he was able to like st step back from the problem more, if that makes sense. It's like, in games this is a thing that happens a lot where it's like you think one thing is a problem, but actually the, the, that is like a symptom of a larger problem or a problem that is over here or something like that. And so he was able to like contextualize these things in the experience and um, in the like full move set in the full possibility space in a way that I was not at the time. Um, and I just found it really exciting and really interesting to like just be in a room with him and hear him have thoughts about my thing. Were there any examples of that with Ape Out where he was where you? Oh yeah. Like, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, anything like, come to mind when you? Um, I mean, it's hard to. Like, uh, yeah. so much of this game came out of conversations with Bennett, mm -hmm. right? Like, um, and a lot of it is just like, like even the, like the structure, for instance, like the album structure, um, came at a time when mm -hmm. I was really struggling with the structure of the game because I tried to like make it just a, I like been through this incubator program and I got funding and I like basically only had like one level of the game when I got a bunch of funding to finish it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it turns out I had no idea what the, how the fuck I was going to finish <laughs> it. Um, which is terrifying. Um, and so I was just like, um, I'm just going to like try to make it through. And I like got like eight levels in, roughly, and it felt OK. And I like had this eight level sequence that felt like it was progressing, and I had set pieces, and it worked. And then I tried to continue it beyond that, and I ended up with something like 20 levels, which I thought was going to be about half the game at that point. Um, and it was just bad. It was just like it didn't retain the, the vibe that I wanted for that long. And I had like spent all summer doing this, and like, you know, we were like over drinks. I was like complaining about it. <laughs> um, and like through that conversation, we like came to this idea of like, one, like this high-level goal of like needing reset points because like so much of the aesthetic of the game is like about escalation, and so you can't escalate for that long, right? Mm -hmm. um, you just run out of headroom. Uh, so the idea of like having these different albums, part of it is like you have a, you have an opportunity to like reset back to zero and then like accelerate in a different direction, basically, and then like the idea of albums on top of that like fits the like, size that they are perfectly and like fits the theme and fits the aesthetic and it's like that's like that's the kind of solution and the kind of conversation that I would yeah. have with Bennett all the time about things. Had you seen previous games that did a similar setup where it's like albums albums music like like basically each each level is an album or each uh, each uh, portion of the game is an album, each level is a different song or um, track. The, the one that comes to mind is uh, Everyday Shooter, if you know that game. I don't know Everyday Does anyone here know Everyday Shooter? No? Okay. Oh, you've heard of it. Yeah, um, okay. yeah it, was like a, it was like an early uh, PS3 indie game, um, which like has music that adapts to 
the gameplay in this really nice way. And they're, they are like tracks. Every there are like nine levels in the game, and each one is a track. And even like it has a scrubber on the bottom. Okay. And like it, it feels like an album in the same way. Um, but it's like a single album. It's, it doesn't break the game up into multiple albums. It's just like the game is an album. Um, okay. And it is more explicitly like it has a specific time, and it's a little bit more more direct. But um, that's probably the closest I can think of. And the, and the music you said directly was uh, Pharaoh Sanders, like a, ja a jazz musician, was like the direct influence for. Yeah. Um, so, and so what the, what the song was? Uh, was it you? Uh, You've got to have freedom. You got to have freedom. Yeah. yeah. And so when you're listening, like that, that song ends the whole game. But when you're listening to that, you're you're simultaneously coding, like while you're listening to yeah. music. Yeah. <laughs> kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there was like a, there was this uh, the following summer after the first the, so there's foiled summer and there's ape out summer one and then there's incubator summer um, which is like after I graduated college I got into this incubator program at NYU where I was going to work on the game for three months over the summer and um, the song uh, you got to have freedom which was playing earlier um, is this Ferris Sanders song where he's just really like wailing on the saxophone for 10 minutes and it's like it was this thing that I was obsessed with uh, particularly around the time of like feeling trapped in film school and like not knowing hmm. what to do um, and it was just a thing that I like really really deeply vibed with and like felt like it was really important to me and like over the course of that summer where like I really feel like the game found itself where I found the game and I figured out what was good about it and what I wanted to make it into. Um, I was just like walking to work every day, like listening to that, and blasting in headphones and like coding to it and everything else. And it was just like I was just living in that vibe mm -hmm. all the time. It was awesome. Did you start to, and you started to feel like you had a path in game development as opposed to filmmaking? Yeah, yeah. It yeah. was, that, that whole transition is I think I still don't feel like I totally have a handle on. Really? Um, wow. Yeah, I mean, I think I never really, uh, like, I think it happened very abruptly and I didn't fully internalize it. It was just like when Foil got a good response, right? Yeah. And when people liked it and it was like, all these people who I, like, admired were talking about it. Um, and it was, like, really shocking and it, like, immediately, like, materialized this path where it was, like, I was kind of just doing this experiment for a couple months where I was like going to try to do this thing and that's kind of the way I framed it to myself and then like all of a sudden it's like oh shit no it's your life that's it wow. you're doing this now which I like it a lot better it turns out yes yeah. it was yeah. also like a very intense and very like fast materialization of that path so it happened like so quickly that you're not able to essentially maybe uh I wouldn't say not appreciate it, but not, it's hard. It's hard to recognize, I guess, sometimes because maybe it happened yeah. so quickly. Yeah. But this, I mean, this game got an amazing response. Yeah. Like, yeah, and, and what was, what was your, what on, on release date for this? What was your, were you what, like reading the reviews for it? Were you looking around online to see what people were saying? I like skim the reviews. Yeah. Yeah. I can't read the reviews. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. that's too much. Yeah. But I can like get the sense and like read a sentence that I think I'll like. <laughs> you know? well, well, there's almost every review I ever saw was like, I mean, like extremely positive. Were, yeah. were there anything? Was there anything you saw that you were surprised by, or that you wanted to critique, or like, or that you, uh, you know? I mean, in general, I was really happy with the response. And I yeah. was just like grateful that I felt like I had wasted my time because by the end it was a really, really long time, and it was like the last couple months were really, really grueling. Well, and it was, it was about um, what, four or five years doing this. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, and then the last couple months were like, it was to get it, this fucking thing ruined my life. <laughs> oh, the, the, the switch. <laughs> yeah. Uh, why? Why did that ruin your life? Um, because it's really slow. Um, okay. More, more or less. It's yeah. more complicated than that. But basically, like getting it. Uh, I we had a porting house, and I kind of thought that meant I didn't have to worry about it. Um, but then at a certain point, I realized. Uh, the thing that they had like finished work on um, was running at like 15 frames a second and would crash every 20 minutes. Oh wow, okay. Um, and so it's like, I basically had to re-engineer huge parts of the game um, 
for the in the last two or three months of development. Was there a part of you that thought, well, maybe I just want, if it's that hard, I just won't do it on the Switch? No, because I had already done all this stuff and committed to it. And okay. I was, I was fucked. So you don't, you don't necessarily, like, I mean, even even the, the five years you were doing it, 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 the points that it became really hard, did you think about quitting and just doing something else? Um, I never really thought about quitting, but I did think about, like, what if I just wrap this up hmm. as a half-finished thing, basically. Yeah. Um, and uh, I was really um, rescued, like, in the last year by Matt and Bennett, who, um, Matt was working on it before that, but not really intensely, um, and... Matt, Matt did the music for Matt it. Matt did all the music and sound. Yeah. Um, and so, he started working on it really intensely in, uh, like, February or, uh, maybe March of last year, March, April. Um, and around that same time, Bennett came on to help with art stuff, and, that was like really what allowed me to get over the finish line. Well, that that was one of the quotes I read from you that like was inspiring to me, just because it was like uh, I tend to want to work by myself because yeah. I don't like some. It's just like just easier. I'm like this is what I want. This is what I think I want. You know, but there are so many times I've been proven wrong where it's like when you actually collaborate with somebody, how much farther you can go. I guess the quote is like, if you want something done faster, do it yourself. But you want it done like better, work with somebody else. Uh, yeah, but I, I read that you said that like you learned you shouldn't work alone. You should collaborate. Yeah, basically, I don't want to do that again. You don't want to work alone. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I could for like short projects, but there was just like a period where I just felt like totally stuck and alone with this huge weight and this huge problem, mm -hmm. um, and no clear way out. Um, and it was just like my only job in life for a little, for some period of time, where like, I didn't have anything else going on, and it was like, all right, yeah, just gotta finish this thing that you don't ever want to see again, because you've been looking at it for three years, yeah. and it's like, that is rough, um, and, yeah, I, like, I don't know how people do that, people who can do it. I mean, even, very rare. even playing it now, did you, did you, like, you just, was it like, oh god, okay, like, this again? Did you? Was there any? Yeah, I never want to play it again. Really? Okay. Uh, <laughs> I feel like I just tortured yeah. you in front of everybody. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, it's just like I had to play it so many times. Yeah. Uh, particularly at the end, right? Like it's like figuring out, like testing it on the Switch. Um, like there were like over a hundred builds or something toward the like in the last couple weeks of like before this like the the final Switch patch went through, where I was like making it faster and fixing stuff and like yeah, just like playing it over and over and over again and like you have to do like full playthroughs every time right like anytime you think that this might be the build yeah which is sometimes you have to like play the whole game from start to finish with headphones on paying attention to see if anything is broken and because also like other people can help with that and Ben have helped a lot um, yeah. did a lot of playthroughs um, but if it's not me or Ben right it's like nobody else knows necessarily when something is broken, right? Like, yeah. it's just like, oh, I don't know if that's supposed to look like that or not, or if that's supposed to sound like that or not. Like, yeah, I mean, it's, I, not always, it's not always super obvious. And it's interesting, because I, I, don't, I don't code, as I said before, but I've, I've heard that if, like, okay, one thing is wrong with the coding, it could screw up the entire rest of the game or rest of the project or what you're working on. Yeah, I mean, it's just like, a lot of it's just like whack-a-mole. Like, yeah. You just fix one thing and two more things happen. It's like doing that over and over again, it just gets so tiring. I, I, uh, I do want to get to like, just audience questions. Uh, Dan, are there any questions on Twitch? Let's see. So we're, we're on Twitch, I, we, I'm, assuming, I'm assuming we have uh, thousands of viewers. Do you want me to tell you how many viewers? How many, how, well, how many questions do we have? That's the real thing that I want to know. Um, we do not have any questions. Great, that's wonderful. <laughs> um, well, I, I, before we get to just questions from anybody here, I, uh, uh, two two things is one uh, you said that doing this uh, you prefer this a lot more because it beats getting like a real job. Uh, so uh, one is what what do you think you would have been doing otherwise if you hadn't been doing this, and then also just uh, what do you have coming up that you're that you want to be working on, or 
What are you looking forward to? Um, I don't know. I probably would have like turned into like a sound guy or an editor, mm -hmm. most likely. And I probably wouldn't be having a great time doing that. Um, but that's like where a lot of people who I know from that time ended up. It's like just like working on set or like getting gigs here and there, mm -hmm. basically. Um, and I probably just would have been one of those people. Um, and right now I'm like, uh, I'm teaching, I just finished, this was the last week of classes. Um, and so I'm teaching people how to make video games, which is hard, it turns out, also. <laughs> um, and uh, Yeah, I'm, I'm curious about that experience, because yeah. that's, it's like, you, you had said, Ben, it was a really helpful professor for you, and was catching things you didn't catch. Are you finding yourself catching things oh, yeah. for students that... Yeah, of course. Okay. Yeah, it's a lot. It's, I mean, it's great. I mean, the thing that I really like is like sitting with people who um, can use feedback, right? And yeah. like, actually, like, want it and need it and understand it and are at the point where they're like ready for it. And like being able to give them like good critique and like point them at things that are going to make them better, it's like so satisfying. Yeah. Do you find anyone being maybe very defensive or sacred about like what they had done and any feedback they're getting there? Yeah, there's some people like that. There's, there are, there are okay. people of yeah. all sorts. I was going right? to say, that's what yeah. I, I would expect that, just because it's, yeah. it's something so personal or something they're passionate about and they're getting feedback that they may not yeah. necessarily want to yeah, hear. Yeah, it's hard. It's right or wrong. But yeah. I mean, there are people that you just vibe with and it's easy. Yes. Yeah. Great. Is there anyone, that, any students that you want to like, the way Bennett would do with you, like partner in a game with? Um, Theoretically. I mean, yeah, I don't know what I'm doing now game-wise, right? Like, I'm, I'm just playing around with little prototypes and stuff. Is that day-to-day yeah. -day at this point? So you're, you're in Brooklyn, but day-to-day, -day, yep. are, you, are you, is that what you're doing at this point? Just working on a new game or just... Um, there are still a few more things that I have to do on Ape Out. Okay. Um, like, uh, you know, we're going to release a demo and, you know, i got to do a Mac build and stuff like that. Um, and um, I'm also just, like, finishing up teaching and stuff and mm -hmm. also just, like, Taking some time to be a human being and like cook meals and eat the meals. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's go important. Go outside and stuff like that. Right, because when you're doing this, you're not outside for a yeah. long period of time. No. Okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah. mostly I, I feel like I did an okay job of that. Of yeah. Like the whole work life dog stuff. But the, yeah, there was a little period in there where it wasn't great. Yeah. So I'm, kind of takes I'm, over. De I'm detoxing a little bit. Okay. Which is nice. That's great. Um, so. Dan, any Twitch questions? <laughs> Probably not. Hey, what? We don't know that. So, uh, nope. Nope, no, no, no Twitch. No Twitch. Okay. Well, how about here? Does anybody have any questions for Git? Yes. So, what kind of games have inspired you? Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. Um, and what games have inspired you? Uh, well, so Nidhogg, of course. I don't know how many people here know Nidhogg. Um, yeah, it's like a cool game. It's like a, it's like a fencing game. So like the first game was inspired gameplay-wise because it's also like a fencing game, and then this game was more inspired aesthetically. Uh, Nidhogg has also like these kind of strong, stark silhouettes with like kind of textured backgrounds and stuff, um, and it's like a related style. Um, and it also has like no UI and a very simple control scheme that kind of has a lot of depth to it. Um, and yeah, just like the first time I played Nidhogg, I like had a I had a sense of just like oh shit, video games are so dumb. So I'm like this is the cool game. The other ones are not cool. And so like I wanted to like kind of synthesize that feeling and create something in that in that vein. Um, and then what was the other question? What games? Uh. Type of what types of games? Oh, I try to, I don't know. I try to not be too much in a bubble. Okay. But, yeah, I don't know. I like weird games right now. I like very hard, weird PC games that are made by Finnish people, you know? <laughs> by Finnish people. Yeah, yeah, specifically. Are there any PC games you recommend that any of us... Um, I'm playing Noita, which is not out yet, um, but is like a, a Finnish game that's like a... <laughs> where like every pixel is simulated and uh, so it's like a deep physics simulation but you're like a wizard and you're going into a, a cave okay. and then there are like all these different fluids that interact in different ways and it's like 
creates all these weird situations that have unexpected consequences. Okay. Great. So, so it's about Noita? Yeah, Noita. Okay, so anybody look out for that. <laughs> uh, does anyone have, yeah, any other questions? Anyone? Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about like your story of working with a publisher, Devolver, and how you mm -hmm. got hooked up with them, and what that, that's been like? Yeah, um, so first I got Indie Fund, um, and I got hooked up with them kind of through the incubator program I was in, and then um, Aaron Isaacson, who was one of the people in Indie Fund, uh, hooked me up with Devolver, and um, basically I like sent them an email with like a, a demo and a trailer, and they were like, yep. We like it. Let's do it. And we like signed a contract pretty quickly. And they're like very chill to work with. It's like there wasn't a lot of pressure from them, um, and they like. Is that normal for most indie developers uh, at all? For I don't know. Uh, from what I hear, it's a little bit. Uh, they they clearly take a lot of pitches in person, like at events and stuff, and. Uh, I think usually it takes a little longer than that, and usually it's a little bit more complicated, but uh, I think because this game was relatively cheap and stuff, it, and they liked it, it was pretty easy. Is there any other? Yes, back there. Uh, what was the impetus to have jazz as the genre like soundtracking? Is it something that just fit with the gameplay the best, or is it a genre of music you always... Um, it was really that like one song, it was like that vibe. Mm, like okay. was trying to like basically like every design decision I was making both aesthetically and like gameplay wise I was like gut checking it against that mm. feeling and that vibe and like pretty quickly I um, was like putting simple hits for the kills and like I just started I started by like just ripping drum solos off YouTube and putting those in and it just felt right. Yes. Do you, do you play jazz? I don't play anything. No. <laughs> I wish I did. Yeah, but, but Bennett, Bennett does, Bennett and, uh, or Matt, Matt. Matt, Matt, well, Matt plays a lot of different things. He's not Matt. specifically a jazz musician, though. Yeah. I mean, um, he'll, he'll bristle at calling all the music in the game jazz, because it is not. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, he learned a lot about, like, drum patterns and, like, was even yeah. generating, like, the story of the music in this game is, like, a whole other hour. <laughs> but, well, that, like, yeah, that, I, I know, I had a lot of questions about that, too. But, yeah. but does, any, does anybody else have... That guy? I think that guy is yeah. Okay. Yes, in so the front. Related, but did you play games when you were younger, or did you not until you started becoming a developer? Were you interested in um, checking out more? Yeah, I definitely did. I was like, um, like when I was a young kid, it was somewhat limited, like what my parents would give me and stuff. But like, kind of in high school, uh, I was in high school like right at the time when like indie games were getting big, um, and so I was like interested in this vein of like more interest in artistic game making as it like was getting, as it was developing and I was getting big and it was like the thing I was like into and interested in and it was like a weird that I could even be a part of it because I was, I just felt like a fan of it. Yeah, yeah but I mean I think that's what's so interesting about it too is because like I grew up being a fan of video games as well but like there's a sense of, oh if you're not, you know, aiming to be like a software engineer, you're not aiming to major in any of the sciences it's like if you like you said if you're in the arts it feels like well that's yeah. not that's not my world game development but like you you're a perfect example of like no you totally can do it you, i mean you absolutely have you put in the time and the effort but like it is something that yeah you know, is doable it's yeah not, you know, it turns out yeah yeah um i think it was actually really nice for me because it was like a thing where i think i do i do just have a lot of technical like i like technical things yeah. um like my mom is a therapist and my dad is an engineer, so. Oh wow! I do, I do have a perfect mix. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah, I have a friend who told me it, it made it makes sense because games are about about how math makes you feel. Right. Um, <laughs> That's. Um, and like, yeah. It's true though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and so yeah. it's like, to me, it's like I I think I was missing. I like the games of both. Like I I want both things in my life. Yeah. Film felt like it was a little bit more. Dryly, or it was it, it didn't have as much technical stuff. And there, there are a lot of technical things in film. It's like not the thing that you're engaging with on a day-to-day -day basis right. as much as games. Games feels like it's more balanced. You're you're doing both artistic thinking and and kind of uh, technical thinking all the time about everything. Yeah, and I think I was, I was told recently also like how 
the reason why you want to keep going with any game is because you get those like dopamine hits <laughs> to you where it's just like you're, you're rewarded so often within the game so there is that therapeutic aspect coming from a math uh, <laughs> coding. Um, yeah, uh, does it, yes, yeah. Are there any other hidden things in APAL and uh, do you have any plans coming for any sort of updates? Um, I'm going back and, back and forth about whether to add anything because I, as you can tell, I don't want to keep working on it. <laughs> yeah. um, but I think if I could add something small that wouldn't take that much time, uh, I'm uh, considering doing it like later this summer or something. Um, but um, yeah, there's a there's we just put in one big secret which somebody found first week. Of course. Now I'm really curious what that Google is. Google the banana secret. You, know, you can find it. The banana secret. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do you know secret. what that is? No. Oh. They're secret bananas. Oh, I didn't. It's like a. I resisted making dumb jokes for this whole game, basically. It's like every buddy who I showed it to, it's like. Hey, Donkey Kong Harambe, yeah, yeah, yeah. man! I, I, I saw that on Harambe. I, I, yep, I saw that on YouTube. There were so many Harambe yeah. quotes. But, but this yeah. is like a Harambe game. Uh, and so it's like so much of my time was spent like I'm not doing any of that shit. So yeah. Now there's like a there's a very cruelly difficult thing you can do to get a dumb joke in this game. <laughs> and I'm really uh, curious. You know, that's good luck. secret banana. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Does anyone else? Yeah. Yes, you go ahead. Um, so, do you, um, what would be like your next step? Are you like form a studio now, or? Um, I'm gonna chill for a little while. Okay. Uh, I'm just gonna keep teaching and keep making, hopefully, small games for a little while. Um, uh, and I don't know. It kind of depends on my circumstances going forward. But um, I have enough. Like the game did well enough where I'm okay for at least a couple of years. Cool. Um, so I can hang out and just make stuff and not make a decision right away. Um, because if it hadn't like if it hadn't gone gotten over a certain threshold, I probably would have had to just go get a job like a real boy job right now. Um, <laughs> but I don't, which I'm very grateful for. How well does game have to do to, for you to be able to survive comfortably? I mean, especially in New York, you know, to survive comfortably. Um, it uh, it sold it sold like around forty thousand copies so far. Wow. Um, nice. Yeah, um, which is nice. Um, I don't get as much money as you might think because there's like you gotta refund everybody. You gotta recoup. Everybody has to recoup and stuff and put money in. Um, but it, yeah, it's great. What, what platform did the best for you? Uh, Switch was better, so I'm glad that I made it work on that platform. Are you porting it anywhere else now? Uh, not at the moment. Um, we'll see. You know, who knows? But hopefully, I don't have to be as directly involved in the next one. Okay, are there any more questions? Yes. Is there a future for Ball Guy with Ball Guy hands? Yeah, I'm, yes, I'm yeah. going to go back to that. Yeah. 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 That's going to be my next game. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> I really want to play that game. Um, yeah. Would you like bike things. Yeah. So, uh, Yes. But one question. Um, so it sounds like when I first played the game, I was like, what does jazz have to do with it? Like, I, I'm curious, like, it seems that the jazz and then the gorilla were arrived at different different um, thought processes. Is that, is that correct? Yeah. It's like, the, it was like every part of the game kind of came in at very different points and like kind of clicked together eventually into a, into a thing that I feel like feels uh, aesthetically coherent, um, but yeah, just for a long time, uh, it just, it didn't have a very distinct identity, I just felt like I was looking for different things, and then like, I would get inspired at a particular time to like, add something that felt like it fit, and I like, got closer to understanding the vibe of the game, and that happened like, at least like six or seven times, where like major things would change, and, I would like feel like I got closer to something that I liked. That's cool. Great. Oh yeah. What platform for PC is it available for? Uh, uh, Steam, GOG, and Itch. Okay. Yeah. No Epic exclusive. <laughs> no. 
weren't able to get that sweet Epic exclusive mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Does anyone else have any questions? Okay. Uh, the last thing I want to do is uh, I just have a quick game that I would like. Uh, I'm going to ask you uh, a few questions. If whether or not I'm going to list a game that existed, mm -hmm. and I want you to tell me whether or not you think this was a real game or not, and then I want you guys to play along as well. Um, let me just pull that up. So I'm just going to list a few. Okay. And you. The first one is uh, Attack of the Mutant Camels. The premise is a bunch of enormous yellow camels are making their way to your base. Since you're fond of your base, you must massacre them from a plane. Attack of the Mutant Camels, is that a real video game? Can you tell me a, a year? Uh, <laughs> I can't. I mean, I can just give you... You know what? Sure, I'll give you a year. 1983. I'm going to say it's not a real game. It's not a real... What do you guys think? No, I don't know. That is a real game. It's, oh. uh, it was on Atari. Oh. So, look at oh. you all. <laughs> Egg on your face. Um, Leisure Suit Larry 3. Passionate Patty in Pursuit of the Pulsating Pectorals. Uh, the premise is, uh, in this third-person adult-themed adventure, horny dork Larry tries and fails to seduce women on an island resort after his girlfriend leaves him for a cannibalistic lesbian slot machine repair woman. Whoa. Mad it's real. real. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's real. Yeah, right off the bat, it's too specific. <laughs> yeah. um, that was on uh, Amiga. DOS, 1989. So, uh, look that one up. Uh, Grapes of Wrath in Pursuit of the Dream. In this third person adventure game, you choose to play as one of the Jodes, the Depression era family kicked out of their Oklahoma farm because of the economic hardship. You walk around the streets of 1930s California, either hugging pedestrians, hitting Hollywood stars, or eating grapes in the hopes that your always, always increasing grape-eating ability will attract the attention of famed Hollywood producer Irving Thalberg. Uh, yeah, I mean, it sounds real because it feels like a thing that would be public domain. Right. That would get made. I'm going to say yes. Uh, nope, that's fake, but it would have been great if it was on PC. <laughs> so, just saying, I think someone should take my pictures. Uh, <laughs> how to be a complete bastard. Uh, premises you invade a party for rich folks and demonstrate your boyish skills of being a complete and utter git. For example, <laughs> loosening the screws on the handles of the disabled toilet. Uh, how, to be, how to be a complete bastard. Not a real game. Not real. What do you guys think? Not real. That is real. Uh, <laughs> how to be a complete bastard. ZX Spectrum, Commodore 64, uh, there's, 1987. So you, could, you can play it. Um, waiting for Gotti. Uh, in, it's December 1998, uh, and you and a friend play as two mobsters waiting for John Gotti to show up to his surprise party. But little do you know, he's being arrested that day. So while waiting, you encounter and fight various characters, including Sammy the Bull, a young Mark Cuban, and Danny DeVito, who is currently on a press tour for Twins. <laughs> I'm going to say not real, but if it is real, I'm going to find it. <laughs> Guys? Um, is it real? It's it's fake. <laughs> but what console would that be good for? Just asking. <laughs> Switch, okay. <laughs> and the final one is bus driver. Premise, you drive a 3D bus around a 3D world. Think, you know, flight simulator, only with buses. That's it. Yeah. 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 It's real. Uh, PC 2007, bus driver. If you want to see what it's like to be a bus driver, play bus driver. <laughs> so, Dan, how are we doing with the Twitch? <laughs> wow. Is it disconnected? No. Well, no, disconnected. No, 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 no. <laughs> so. Uh, no, no questions. Great, no far. questions for Twitch. <laughs> well, Gabe, uh, thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, I uh, really appreciate it. I hope everyone uh, had a nice time. Trevor, thank you so much for hosting this. Uh, if you'd like to donate, there's a donations box over there if you know. If you came here and just want to give a dollar, it goes to Trevor for hosting us, and uh, all the proceeds go to Gabe, Trevor, everyone who, you know, put this together, you know, and so if you ever want to put together an event like this as well, you know, reach out to me. It's through this platform called Artery. It's a, it's a fun thing, so uh, my name is Ian, and this There's is Gabe. Oh, yeah, I'm doing... Plug the next one. Oh, sure. <laughs> why, why not? Uh, the next one I'm doing is called Jews in Sports. Uh, so me and Sandy Koufax are hosting uh, Jews in Sports, where people will, will give uh, presentations about Jews in sports. Uh, so if that sounds interesting, then 
You know, people don't think of Jews as athletes normally. <laughs> and it's going to be at my place. And it's going to be at Allie's place, yeah. So, uh, you know, come to that. All right, have a good night, everybody. Uh, if you want to hang out, we're, we're, gonna, we're thinking of going to the zombie hut, which is nearby. So we're going to get drinks there. So uh, some of us will be there. But, yeah, we're, uh, we're going to leave here around, you know, in the next 10, 15 minutes. Uh, Trevor's got to go work on some music. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe not. If you want to go grab drinks with us too, yeah, that'd be great. All right, thanks very much. Everybody.